Yes. How can we differentiate between Krishna's arrangement or the fruitification of our karma? Well, we discussed this a little bit earlier, but to the extent that Krishna is involved in our lives, then karma is, is not. So, Golokayur Premodhan Harinam Sankirtan. The Sankirtan of the holy name of Krishna, it comes from Golok, I mean, it's not within the realm of karma. So, as much as we are touched by that, gathered up by that, our faith is collected by that, and we are engaged in that, then we are under that influence, and not under the influence of karma. So, generally, other than that, uh, it's to be understood that at the time of diksha, initiation, one is given knowledge, and that knowledge is divine knowledge that is then combined with supporting siksha, teachings, instructions, the... Um, the tool that we have to to uh, to destroy the influence of karma. So Mahaprabhu has told Sanatana Goswami that at the time of initiation, the Dikshakali Atma Samarpan, at the time of initiation one one becomes Krishna accepts one like his very self. Mahaprabhu told Sanatana Goswami this in the context of Sanatana Goswami's desire to give up his life, thinking that he was unfit to be in the company of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But Mahaprabhu told him, no, your body is very special. It's not at, you're not at the liberty to do what you want with it. We're really not at the liberty to do with our body whatever we want in any circumstance. But these were special circumstances. In general circumstance, we're not at the liberty to do whatever we want with our body, although we think that we are. The fact of the matter is, is that our body, composed as it is of senses, has a relationship with uh, powerful influences of, of nature, that a relationship of dependence, and that that should be acknowledged. Gratitude is really a basic quality. And it's said that one who has no gratitude is a very um, undesirable association, lacking gratitude. So gratitude means, for example, what I'm speaking of is that what? We have eyes, so our sense of sight. But in order to utilize that, to take advantage of that, what are we dependent upon? Is it Mohan? Mohan. What, what are we dependent upon in order to see? Sunlight. Sun. So, right. So our eyes, without sun, we cannot utilize them. So some gratitude. Some rec- If you don't want to call it gratitude, if you want to be completely like secular or something... <laughs> And at least you have to acknowledge there's some re- relationship, some dependency. So this is what the rishis, the seers, of times gone by have, have done. They've traced it out and seen, oh, for all of the functioning of my senses and so forth, there's, um, de- there's a dependence upon on nature. And so they developed a reverential attitude towards these um, powerful influences of nature upon which they understood correctly they were dependent to just to function in life. And so they did not think that the body was just theirs to do whatever they wanted with. And we may think like that and ignore such dependence, but it doesn't change the fact that we are dependent. And the ignoring of the fact, that doesn't bode well for us because an ungrateful person is, well, there's a story from Mahabharata, might be worth telling. You know the story of the fellow who went uh, to, the, I think he was a cobbler, he went to seek his fortune, left his business, went to the forest, and uh, he was looking for some time, you know, for gold or something. Of course, he didn't find any, and he became exhausted and famished, and he ran into a, a, ca- a crane, a crane, a heron, a big bird. He was the king of the herons. And so the heron saw him and took good care of him provided for him. And he said, I don't have any money, really, any wealth to give you or anything like that, but there's a king in this area, and um, if you go there, he's generous, and surely he'll take, he'll provide for you. He'll give you something. But, he said, you have to go between sunrise and sunset, because before the sun rises or after it sets, the area is dangerous, because a lot of man-eaters live in the vicinity. So, 
and he went to the king, and the king received him, and oh, he's coming on to, at the suggestion of the king of the cranes, and of course that uh, fellow was well known to the king as a generous fellow, and so the king gave generously to that cobbler. So then getting the wealth, he became a little intoxicated by that. Then he came back through the forest and he came across the crane. And, and uh, wealth, you know, has the potential to degrade us. And we can become intoxicated by wealth, maddened by wealth, and not see things clearly. That's why it's recommended in Kali Yuga. What, Krishanki? The chant, the holy name. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. But what about wealth? What about gold? Bhagavatam says, you shouldn't keep that. You shouldn't hoard that in Kali Yuga. Be careful about that. That will breed then a ground, fertile ground for other problems. So at any rate, he became intoxicated. He came back and he met the king of the cranes on the way back and then he, after a while he thought, you know, I'm hungry. And uh, last time Monsieur Shirley the crane fed me, but uh, it was just crane food. My own preference would be to eat a crane. So, as, as horrible as it sounds, he killed the crane and ate the crane. And so the news came to the king that the crane had been, king of the cranes had been killed. And it was, it was of course, very discouraging to him, disappointing to him. And he wanted to find the the culprit. So he sent out his people and they captured him. And we realized it was the cobbler who he had shown, the crane had shown generosity to, the king had shown generosity to. And the man then showed no gratitude towards the crane. He said, oh, well, this, this, this couldn't that be a worse thing. It would be you. So he said, throw him to the man-eaters. So he threw him to the man-eaters. Is that bad enough? Well, it goes on from there. <laughs> <laughs> the man-eaters, of course, they like to eat men, so they collected them up right away, and they thought they'd have a feast, but then they found out by word of mouth that he had killed the crane, he didn't have any gratitude, and they threw him back. They said, we'll eat any man, but not one that doesn't have any, show any gratitude. <laughs> 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 so, so, this is kind of a basic... Um, quality, it's important for human society, and it's kind of like, in a way, the very kind of remote basis of bhakti, to be appreciative, to be thankful. And we hear that in religious discourse, the grace of God, to, be, to appreciate the bounty of life, and it's been provided, and, and so on and so forth. So it's kind of a, a, a religious or spiritual beginning. It's, it's kind of a religious beginning before it turns into spirituality. It's mentioned in the Gita like this. What is that verse? In the third chapter, in the beginning, Krishna speaks about um, you know, show gratitude and be, uh, appreciate the bounty of life. Anad bhavanti bhutani parjanyaran sambhava. Food comes from grains, and grains come from rains. And he makes this connection. And he, he says, uh, perform sacrifice and be happy. Perform sacrifice means to acknowledge the kind of thing I'm talking about, that, well, in order to see, we need the sun, and so on and so forth. And so, to live a life of uh, such acknowledgement, to show gratitude, and then live bountifully, he says. This is a religious idea. And then if we pursue that, then it, um, it very much, in many respects, qualifies us to look further in terms of our prospect in life. If we learn that by showing gratitude, making some sacrifice, I actually become happy, then we should think, well, this is the way, This we should. how can I increase this? How can I go further with this? And of course, the furthest reach of that comes to Braj Bhakti, Gopi's self-forgetfulness, not even self-sacrifice, from selfishness to self-sacrifice to self-forgetfulness. So, this body is not ours to do whatever we want with. And, and, and if we think so and don't acknowledge as I'm speaking of, that does not bode well for us. We may think we got away with something. Other foolish people are worshipping and wasting their time like this. But 
time will tell who spent their time well. So, in that sense, it's not the case. And when we come, that the body is ours to do whatever we like with it, and Mahaprabhu told Sanatana Goswami that your body, you cannot do whatever you want with it. But that is a different thing. I've taken over that body, like we talked this morning. In Asakti, in this stage, Krishna takes over. That sadhaka deha becomes a prakrita deha, becomes a spiritual body, spiritualized material body. The karma is finished. It's then living in this world, what? Because the karma is finished, but there's, that's only what? That's only one half of the equation of the Bhagavat's idea of mukti. We're not against mukti. Sarvabhama Bhattacharya, when he was converted by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he wanted to change the Bhagavatam, one word in the Bhagavatam. It is mentioned that Jivetayo Mukti Pade Sadayabhak. This verse is important to the discussion. How does it begin? Tate Nukampam Susamikshamana Bhundhane Bhatmakritam Vipakam Hridvag Vapube Hridam Namaste Jivetayo Mukti Pade Sadayabhak. It says that one who goes on in this life accepting his or her fate, the good and bad that comes, without bothering about it, that such a person, and remaining the implication is steadfast in his or her resolve to serve Krishna, becomes the rightful inheritor, the heir to mukti pade. It means liberation at the feet of Krishna. So it means to go as we say, back to Godhead, this idea. Can I ask one thing? What would it mean to not accept your fate? What, what kind of action would that be then if you don't accept your fate or your karma or whatever? That would be ignorance. But what, what physically would it be? I mean, how can you not accept what happens to you? Oh, what it means in this verse is to accept what happens to you, is, is to, not, to not try to fight it. Mostly people spend their lives trying to increase their happiness and avoid the stress, and they're busy with this. But at a certain point, one realizes, oh, there's a certain amount of happiness I'm going to get, and there's a certain amount of distress I'm going to get, and rather than spending my time trying to increase one and decrease the other, there are better things to do. And the better thing to do is to pursue love of God, which is ultimate happiness and freedom from all distress. So he or she holds fast on that idea, and then what's due, he or she accepts. Now, this verse can be understood in different ways. It can, on a lower level, it can say, well, so that devotee accepts his or her karma. That means th- that they, that devotee is in a certain standing that he or she can do that. Their standing and faith in, in the realm of experience is such that they have the fortitude and the vision to do such. So we, we can't imitate that. We're told in the Gita, tat tam that we should try to learn how to tolerate the ups and downs, the hots, the colds, the goods, the bads, the happies and sads of life. Try to tolerate them and don't fall off the wagon. I don't like, <laughs> but hang on. Don't fall off the boat. But hang on, and it may rock sometimes, but something like that. So to tolerate. But this verse of the Bhagavatam really seeks to take, take us a step further, as the Bhagavatam takes us a step beyond the Gita. The Gita is often th- thought to be a life guided by spiritual intelligence. And the Bhagavatam is a life guided by the spiritual heart. If we follow the Gita's divine wisdom, then our spiritual heart can come out. And live in the in the in the world of of Sriman Bhagavatam. So this other verse that we talk comes from Bhagavatam. It talks about tolerance also, and, and so, but it takes try it seeks to take us to a higher conception of that. And ultimately, uh, I believe Vishwanath Chakravarti has commented upon this verse in this way to say that the, for the devotee there is no karma, and he or she sees the good or the bad that happens that Krishna is arranging this. Krishna has arranged this bad, so-called, to help me, to chasten me to him. He's given me some good to use in his service. 
So he or she sees like this, and it's not untrue. But that is at a higher stage of bhakti. The beginning of such a life, moving in that direction, this is nishta. So first comes diksha, initiation. That's called bhajana kriya. After we get some initial faith, then we associate with people of similar mind. And in the context of that association, we find someone in that company that really serves to um, foster our faith. So we latch onto that person. And that person becomes our, our guide, guru. And he or she instructs us. He gives it mantra and then instructions. Then we get enter the life of bhajan, bhajana kriya, the, the, the activities of bhajan, how to do that. And he or she explains. And as we do that, then we're dealing through divine intervention by applying ourselves in relation to these, what we've gotten, these instructions, with the implications, the karmic implications of our lives. So, so many anarthas. We have anarthas come from good karma, anarthas come from bad karma. An artha means value, so a sense of value that's really false. What we think is important, this is or valuable, all under the influence of material nature. Good karma, bad karma, an artist from each of these, an artist from offenses. There may be an artist that crop up in the context of applying ourselves in bhakti also, like weeds that come when you grow a flower. So one has to be diligent about these anarthas in this stage of bhajana kriya and by embracing that bhajana kriya in a do or die kind of attitude, these anarthas come out. And so when we come to nishta bhakti, it means that our faith becomes firm and our practice becomes fixed. It's not vacillating, it's not up and down, unsteady. Then at this stage, as I said, the smoke of, the, of our karmic implication is, fire is, is extinguished, some smoke is lingering. But Baba Mahadavagani, the great conflagration of samsara, like a great forest fire, the fire's out. I mean, there's a lot of work to do still, a lot of cleanup, and a lot of smoke, because it's a big fire, <laughs> very big fire. But there's some relief. They can report the news now. The fire's out. It's contained. The fire's been contained. In, in, I don't know about here, but in Northern California, we have big forest fires every summer. It's the greatest fear for people living in the country. And they just, when the time comes, they just have a life of their own. You could try to contain them, but what happens in those instances, they have all these firemen, hundreds of them, and they're digging and plowing and trying to make a circle around the fire and so that you know it reaches a certain point and there's no more trees and it just dirt and they bring airplanes and spray things and water and so forth. But you know what they do mostly? What does every fireman do? That's right. He prays. Oh God. Don't don't blow the wind. Hmm? But send a rain. They're praying this is every fireman. <laughs> this is his ultimate ultimate uh, resort. Because you see it's really beyond our control. Nature has an appetite here for fire and forest will be consumed to some extent. It's, in, it's God's will. When there are powerful manifestations of nature like this that show our um, how feeble we are, then it, it puts, helps to put things in perspective for us. We become thoughtful. Now many people go into the, to the grave because of great uh, powerful dis dis uh, disturbance in nature. And nations and people will mourn and so forth, and it's appropriately, and we should feel some pain for the pain of other people who are suffering. And it's natural. But then life will go on and people will forget, and it will just become a statistic. I read that uh, some 200 plus years ago, 40,000 people died from a similar thing in China that we don't even know about it or think about it. So this is really the norm in the world. This is going on. As they said, they said in Mahabharata, what Yudhisthira was asked, what is the most wonderful thing? What did he say? 
He said the most wonderful thing is that, that although people are dying all the time, there's death all around us, everyone thinks it's not happening to me, or at least they act in that way, as if it's not happening to me. He said, this is wonderful, Vishnu Maya. I mean, do you really need a book? The world is speaking to us very loudly about what it's like. It's showing its face at every moment. The nature of this plane of experience. The world is talking to us. But we're not listening. That's why we need a guru, a guide, because we're not listening. We're not paying attention. But he or she is not telling us anything that isn't as plain as a nose on our face. At least with regard to the nature of material, the material predicament. And when we start to see that and understand that, then those things that he or she talks about that we can't see, we believe it anyway. Because our guide is showing us what was right in front of our face, like our nose, and we couldn't see it. And the whole the world, the environment itself, it's not a dead thing, it's all it's talking to us. I like that nice verse of Bhagavatam, Prabhupada used to quote it in the final days of his, his presence amongst us. Ayur harati vaipum sam mudyanastam chayamaso. With the rising and setting of the sun every day, our lives are being taken away. What could be, what could speak more loudly to us than the sun moving across the sky every day? I mean, without, if, if it didn't come up tomorrow, of course here in Finland it's different. <laughs> I guess it doesn't, but uh, if it stopped coming up the world over, I guess it would be shining in one place and down in another. But anyway, if it just went out, then we'd be finished, right? We wouldn't have enough light to read, the, read, the, read about it in the paper. So, every day it's rising and setting, and ayur harati, our life, ayur harati, is being taken away. Life as we know it. I can't think of a more prominent feature of nature than the rising and setting of the sun every day. And the Bhagavatam, you see the rishis, they looked at that and they said, Oh, that's what it's saying. So they wrote it in the book. And then they wrote the implications of that and, and so forth. They got that inspiration. But the, 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 the world is saying, it's not that they just made up some, something and wrote it down in a, in a book. No. We read it in the book and then we try to look and see if it's true in the world, but it is. The world is... And it, so eventually they don't need, need the book. That's true. People used to tell me on book distribution, I don't need a book. God's not in a book just in a book. There's more than a book. I used to sell the books, of course. I said, that's true, but when you've understood everything in a book, then you can put that into practice. If God wants me to take the book, I'll take the book. Sometimes they would say that. I said, he does, <laughs> and I'm here to tell you about it. You should take it. If you can read everything in the book, understand the book, the book is... Where, where did you get that idea? I would ask him, where did you get that idea that everything's not in the book? Then I would answer for them, you got it from a book. That's if it was in a book, who was told you that. <laughs> and anyway, what kind of book is this? Atmaramas Chamunayo, Nir Granta Api Urukame. Ahaituki, what is it? Kurvante Ahaituki Mukti. Itambuta Guno Hari. Sukadev. He was wandering as a young lad. Naked, it means oblivious to external conditions. Living in the woods, he ran away from home at an early age. Of course, he was born late, but <laughs> ran away into the forest. And so his father, Vyas, sent some woodcutters into the forest and told them, sing these poems when you cut wood in the hopes he had that his son would hear those poems and understand that his father had an extraordinary mission for him in life. The son was afraid. He didn't want to get entangled just in family life. He wanted to be... Uh, he wanted liberation from samsara. So the woodcutters went and they sang these songs, songs from the poetry of Vyas, which is Srimad Bhagavatam. Everything 
some philosophical verses a little like this and some beautiful poems about Krishna. Barapidam. Hmm, what is that verse? He's got it on his ears, flowers hanging, hmm, so beautiful, entering into the into the forest with his friends and cows. Description gopis are describing him like this. This is the perfection of sight. To see these kind of songs, he was singing. The woodcutters were singing. Vyas gave them. Of course, Sukadev heard the song, and when he heard those songs. He thought, this is not anything from this world. I left home to leave the world. But these songs are taking me to a place that's beyond leaving the world. Where is that? He followed the woodcutters home and he came to the hermitage of Vyas. Hmm. And he knew his father had a special mission that was to teach him what? Simad Bhagavatam. And there in this verse, Atmarama Chumunayo, he was Atmarama, self-satisfied. He had no necessity whatsoever. He was not under the influence of karma. Being under the influence of karma means that we have a necessity, a perceived necessity, that if I don't do this, I won't survive. So I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. We have a bumper sticker like that in California. People keep him busy. By the force of a perceived necessity, if you don't eat, then you won't live. So, better get to work. But these verses spoke of another kind of movement, free from necessity, lila, play. Hearing that, Vyasa was, was charmed. Therefore, Atmanamas Chumunayo, Nyagranta Api Urukame. Nyagranta. He heard, he heard Srimad Bhagavatam from his father, but it is Nyagranta, it is like a beyond book. It's a book, but what is the subject? And if you study the book, then you you. Uh, and he, you know, he was near, he was beyond books. It means near Granta. He was Atmanam. He was beyond book learning. Still, he became attracted to Srimad Bhagavatam. What kind of book is that? So they would say sometimes, "I don't. When God's not in a book." But you heard that in a book. Now, this book tells that, and this book says that, actually. It says many other things, also. When you learn this book, then this is the real book of life. In this book, you can find that you have a place in the book, even. A page, a paragraph, a sentence, half a sentence, a word, to be in there as a punctuation mark. That is a great thing. In the drama of Krishna Leela, to get a part there, so th this is the nature of Srimad Bhagavatam, to, to read Srimad Bhagavatam, to hear Srimad Bhagavatam. This is what advanced devotees do. They hear, particularly the tenth candle of Bhagavatam, and they find a place in there. They find some attraction. They find some, what do we call it? Swarup. Stahibhav. Swarup, yeah. That is the basis of the Swarup. Stahibhav. Some dominant s spirit of sentiment of liking Krishna in a particular way. And they eventually find themselves entering there. This is an entrance point. It's like, you know, a special fifth dimension. Panchama Purushartha, Turatita Gopalam. Beyond the fourth. It means beyond the fourth. Four stages of consciousness. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep means life beyond physical and mental. Waking is the physical plane, and when we sleep, the physical plane closes down for all intents and purposes, and we experience the mental plane. But when we go into deep sleep, we don't dream either. So the message is, when you wake up, I slept well, and I was somewhere, because I can remember that I was there, that I, that I slept well, that I had an experience, but it was an experience beyond thought and beyond any physical stimulus. So there's life beyond the mind, there's life beyond the body, and it's ultimately Turiya, the fourth dimension, beyond deep sleep, to go there through 
spiritual practice and not wake up, something like that. But Turiyati Tagopala, there's a fifth dimension, that's what Mahaprabhu was speaking about. Hmm? This kind of mukti, mukti pade. When Sarvabhama heard the verse, after being converted by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to bhakti, and he read that verse, he, said, he scratched out the word mukti, he couldn't take it. Because Mahaprabhu's teaching is, is, is not about running away from anything, mukti, getting away from anything. It's about going, embracing life for what it's really about. So having understood that, then Sarvabhama wanted to cross out the word mukti in the Bhagavatam. But Mahaprabhu said, no, you can't change the Bhagavatam like that. That's not a good idea. But understand it like this. Mukti Pade. This is speaking about liberation at the feet of Krishna. So this is the Bhagavatam's idea of Mukti. Mukti Ritvanata Rupam Swarupena Bhavastiti. There's two aspects to the to the liberation of the Bhagavatam. One is what? Clearing the slate of karma. Clearing the negative out. Taking out the trash. Finished. But something more. What is that? Swarupena vivastiti. To establish oneself and one's positive identity in relation to the Lord. So this is the life of the Baba Bhakta. So he's finished with karma. In Nishta, he gets his, his diksha and bhajana kriya, then he applies himself. And when she applies herself nicely, then false values are exposed for what they are. And what's really valuable, real wealth, comes to light. And when one can see what's really valuable, then not distracted by any, any false gold anymore. So just going for that. This is, again, forest fires out. But there's some smoke. Some smoke. But the, the fact that it's out... That's very relieving, and you know the smoke will dissipate. It's a matter of time, so you have the, you have the wherewithal to, to hold on. No, you're not letting go now. So, this verse that Sarvabhama tried to change, Tate Nukampam Susamikshamanam, Vishwanathakuri Thakur has spoken about it in a nice way by saying that this is about that time in life, one's life, the life of the sadhaka, when the ups and downs, the goods and bads, the happies and sads of life, they're, they're not the, the influence of karma, but they are the Krishna's interaction. So it it's kind of begins at this stage. In the, and in Asakti, two stages later, at the end of sadhana, it reaches its full manifestation. And karma is over. So before that... There's some influence of karma in our life. Although initiation does away with karma, it means it gives us the tools to deal with the karmic situation appropriately. And as we apply ourselves over time, we reach the fruition of diksha, of initiation. And that means that because diksha, initiation, is what we call part of sambandha jnana, knowledge of what's what, knowledge of who I am, in relation to God, in relation to the world, what the world is in relation to God, and all these things. Well, when this reaches its fruition, what happens? One becomes self-realized. He becomes complete in tattva, tattva gyan. Sambandha gyan is not just theoretical knowledge. That is also part of sambandha gyan, collecting the theoretical knowledge, but applying the theoretical knowledge when it's fully applied, it means when we fully apply ourselves in relation to the diksha, which takes generally takes some time, dependent upon what? Our background, our baggage. So everyone's, of course, not coming from the same background. If someone comes to bhakti with a pure heart, a jnani, then he will go very quickly. That's what we find in the classic of Thakur Bhakti Vinod, Jaiva Dharma, the two principal characters, Brajanath and Bijay, Bijay Kumar, they went very quickly through the stages of bhakti. For us, it's taking a long time, but they went very quickly because, they, the, because of the background they came from. One was a jnani, one was uh, inquisitive. Arto jignasu artarti jnani cha bratarshava. So they went quickly. But generally, it takes some time. 
and it, when it's complete, then one's complete in tattva again. One can then fully cultivate sentiment. We're cultivating sentiment from the beginning for Krishna. But when we know our ourself, when we glimpse ourself, real self, oh, it's like, that's what I am. It's still over here a little bit, but I can see that's what I am. It's clear now, picture. Go after that. Cultivate that feeling. So when Sambandha is complete, then the Abhideya, the practice, the means to realize the prayojan, the fruit, the goal, that will be complete also. So the complete Abhideya of Bhakti. Bhakti is Cheshtarup and Bhavarup. So when it's, it means it, it's, it's about activity and it's about emotions. So when the emotional side comes to bear, then that kind of sadhaka is a, is a jatarati sadhaka. His or her sambandhagyan is complete. The diction, the function of diksha is complete. In as much as diksha is removing the, destroying the past and giving you the tools to write your own future. To write your future. To write your page in the book of life. And this is who I am. And this is my place. This is what it's about. It's so exciting. This bhakti, what it, what it, <laughs> what it is. Reading the book in Bhava Bhakti and thing, and that's where I fit in, right there. This what, see, this is what it's about. I'm just gathering this information and regurgitating it to help to to save the world from meat eating karmis or something like that. It's, that doesn't. It's to find your place there, and to bow before that. To think, what a place! Such a it's a worshipful place. But what I am actually is venerable from my present perspective. Such a glorious thing, what I can be in relation to Krishna. Such a, such a thing. How exciting. You find, you find your way in there. And naturally, you know, you, in associating with other people, it becomes contagious and so forth. The humility, the, the, the regard for that that one has, the sense of the value of that, that is preaching is about that. What valuable thing I have. So when the sambandha is complete, then you have all at your disposal to fully apply yourself in Abhideya Tattva. It's not just the activities, doing bhakti, that means with the senses, atashi krishna namadi, namabhad dukhaya mindrai. We talked about this before and today. You cannot serve Krishna with material senses. If somehow bhakti touches you, us, through the Guru Parampara, and our senses are engaged in bhakti. Our tongue is engaged in chanting Krishna Nam, and Krishna Nam cannot be chanted with material senses. So its senses are becoming spiritualized. And so bhakti is performed with the senses, and it's performed with emotion. So when bhava comes, then you're doing both. The sambandha jnana is complete, initiation is complete, and so the abhideya is fully, you can do full Fully apply yourself in terms of the means, and then you will get the fruit of prema. So, what the question is, what in our life is our karma, and what is Krishna's grace or arrangement or something like that? So, it would be relative to our to our progress. And the more we apply ourselves, the more we take shelter of Krishna. You can be sure, Krishna will be in your life. This is very hard to understand. That Krishna actually comes into the life of the sadhaka. But then we say, to the extent that he or she is a sadhaka, then it's not so hard to understand. Because we, many of us, we are just only sadhaka in, in name. But the point is that who becomes a sadhaka like Krishna said, Dikshakali, at that time I make him like myself. At the time of initiation, I make him like myself. I make his body in a prakriti deha. It's a spiritual body. And in that body he serves me. So, if you apply yourself, then you won't have a karmic body. Karma is removed completely. Adasakti means liberation. But still what happened? Because liberation of the Bhagavatam is twofold. That part is complete, 
still there's something else to do. So you need a body to do that in, is the idea. So Krishna takes over the body of the devotee. He engages in, in bhava bhakti. And then he takes birth where Krishna is performing his lila. Associates with the eternal associates of Krishna who come at that time. And then he, in, that involves the development of the stayibhav. Stayibhav is in bhava bhakti. There's a manifestation of stayibhav. And the manifestation in prem bhakti, the full manifestation. So one thinks... Oh, I like Krishna, like my, this is my sentiment for Krishna. One feels it, one realizes. To serve Krishna as a gopo or as a gopi. That may be the case. And then, so that is the beginning, and he cultivates that. And when she completes that cultivation, then takes birth in Krishna Lila, to further develop that in terms of sneha, man, pranay, Rag, Anurag, Bhav, Mahabhav. These are all stay bhavs, actually. It means that they're a way of intensifying and embellishing the primary rasa. And these, these symptoms, affection, man means like um, jealous love, pranai, like love, love, like equality, rag, attachment, Anurag, more attachment. <laughs> Following that, and bhav, then mahabhav. This is a different idea of bhav than the earlier idea of bhav. Bhav, mahabhav. So, relative to the stai, if it's a, you're a gopo or a gopi, as may be the case, then these this stai bhav will be developed in Krishna lila, in the prakat lila, the manifest lila. When that is complete, then from what we call swarup siddhi, one goes to bhastu siddhi. That means back to Godhead, and that means never to return, except when Krishna comes, you come with him. <laughs> that other thing. But that's not the end of the material world. So, so where does the karma end up, uh, leave off, and where does Krishna's interaction in our life uh, begin? This is a kind of a general uh, overview. Hmm? You can look at those different stages and see ourselves in relation to that. But it's also kind of general. I mean, it, these things, there's a lot of overlapping and gray areas and and so forth between these different stages and so, so on. Does that help? What else? Yes? Um, I remember when I was living in the temple, we used to think or Whatever we did, we started the day with the good rounds. And then when you were doing a direct service, like whatever, whoever did, you could kind of see the result that I was Krishna conscious today because I sold many books and this or that. But what does actually mean that when you are not doing direct service that you are Krishna conscious? Does it mean you really think in your mind, Krishna? Well, first of I'm all... just doing everyday things, or if you have your work, or whatever. What, what does it mean to be Krishna conscious <coughs> in a moment? Well, um, it's not just about doing things. In fact, we refer to that as direct service, but we would more refer to that as maybe indirect service. Yeah, or in any situation. <laughs> yeah, what I mean by that is that uh, direct service would be to serve Krishna in his leela. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Direct service. And that's uh, that's that's desirable. Now, in the stage of state of asakti, one service starts to be actually accepted. There, acknowledged. There, it's reaching there. Just beginning, and in bhava bhakti, it's reaching. In other words, that devotee is is chanting and hearing and meditating on Krishna's pastimes. And that meditation is, is substantial. It's real. He or she's getting real experience. And through, through the guru, it's being accepted. He's getting some beginning of lila seva. This is direct seva. So before that, in a sense, our seva is indirect. And it's meant to help us to come in that direction. 
so we can busy ourselves with so many things of Krishna's work and so forth, like you were talking about. You get up and you chant, and then you distribute books and so on and so forth. And if that's done properly, then it should give rise to some attraction for hearing, chanting. You can sit peacefully and chant. Or you can chant and arctic and the mind won't go somewhere else. And so when you start to get absorbed, so inner life is supposed to come from that. And then that inner life is cultivated. And when the inner life is being cultivated, then one may be doing anything outside. But inside, something else is going on at the same time, invisible to others. So he or she might be engaged in ordinary activities, but how they're thinking about those things, in what way, difficult to understand. Vaishnavera kriya mudra vignana bhujhai. I would say they're difficult to understand the movements of a, of a Vaishnav. What is the motivation behind them? So it's good to be busy in Krishna's service, but the fruit of that should be that I can sit down and find I'm attracted to Krishna. And so as one can can do that, one's mind can become fixed, into, like Nam Smarn, you can do Japa and not be distracted and so forth. Then, then in the name, Krishna's form is there. In the name, Krishna's qualities are there. Krishna's lila is there. So you'll experience those those aspects of Krishna through chanting his name. And as you move progressively in that way, in your mental fixation, then it's possible that you might move away from even external activities. But some great devotees don't do that. They, they advance internally in regard to external activities like preaching in, in, in particular. So I don't know if I've answered your question well enough, but... Yeah, this went a bit elevated. <laughs> I was speaking a bit more in an earthly platform. So you were saying that if you weren't busy doing something, like now you're not in an ashram environment, and, and so, but you want to be Krishna conscious. So how will you be Krishna conscious? Yeah, during the day. I mean, it's easy if I read a book about Krishna or chant, but many times <coughs> devotees taught me, if you chant in the morning, good rounds, you are the whole day Krishna conscious. And that sounds wonderful, but when I really sit down and think, what does it mean? Well, all that means is that, is that what that means is that as much as you've sat down and chanted and got, got something out of that, you carry you, it should carry with you in the day in terms of how you interact with people and things and, and so forth. So the measure of the of the value of your or the extent of your absorption in the chanting will, in a sense, be seen by what happens afterwards. Just like people go and hear the recitation of the Bhagavatam from some speaker in India and he gives a very nice talk and it's very interesting and then they go away and smoke and beat their wife or whatever. <laughs> and it's, so yeah, it happens. So uh, it's just like a form of entertainment. And um, it may be for a couple of reasons. One is because of the way in which they approach the thing. The other may be the, the condition of the heart of the speaker. Because if the condition of the heart of the speaker is pure, then it, that speaking, if we listen, we pay attention, that should move us. It should start to make us honest and start to change our heart and we feel that happening. Can't get away from this, we're thinking. It's after us. It comes after, after the talk. It's, it haunts us. He's still there. <laughs> Something like that. So... To the extent that we apply ourselves in the, in the right situation in relation to uh, hearing about Krishna, then it should carry on, carry over <coughs> to an extent in the way we think about things, the way we relate to people and what we do, and then return to the chanting and hearing and then go out again. And so, in a general sense, like if we hear about Leela, Krishna, there afterwards it should be thought about. We should be thought about the. You should think of the implications of the discussions. That is how to take advantage of the discussion. So when you move, you're not just there and you go away. It's gone. So many ideas have been shared with you. So the idea is that this is going to go around in your head. You're going to think about it and dream about it. And wake up in the morning. Yeah, he said that. Or she said that. Or what does that mean? Now I've got a question. I wish he was here. I could ask him that. 
And then I want to, like, but he's not here, so maybe I'll look in a book. Let's see what's in the book. And find something. And find something else in the book. That's interesting. Um, ask about that, too. And this way you become preoccupied. So the basis of our preoccupation that we seek with Krishna is hearing and chanting. So therefore somebody might say, if you chant nicely in the morning, then you'll be Krishna conscious all day. I think that's probably what they mean. Yes? So is it a bit like if someone I know or someone I care about is in danger or is sick or something, then I I'll go to work and do my work like on any regular day, but my thoughts will always wander to that direction. So yeah. in the same way I should, after chanting my lungs in the morning, have such strong emotions. Yeah, the only difference is that that while your thoughts would be drawn back to Krishna like they would to that friend who's sick or something like that or uh, or somebody you're attached to regardless of. the only difference is that in time while your thoughts are being drawn back to Krishna eventually they'll be drawn to see the universality of Krishna the object of your love so then you start to see Krishna even in ordinary things that you're doing. First you, you chant and you hear you go to work and you're thinking about Krishna and you're kind of at work, your mind's going back to Krishna. And after a while then you, you start to see that, oh, this is a manifestation of Krishna's Shakti. Hmm. There's the Tamaguna. Hmm. Here's the Rajaguna. So you feel with Krishna. You see the influence of these modes of nature on the people, and and, and it's like you're starting to see that uh, Krishna, and philosophically, and and um, ultimately you find that Krishna is not just uh, over here in in the box, hmm? something like that. So then you're Krishna conscious everywhere. And everything is being, you're seeing it in light of Krishna and reminding you of the person Krishna. And it's not something you're doing to get done with so you can go back to Krishna. But what you're talking about is, is the beginning, right? Could it also be seen like if you do something, if you do a good job or if you really focus on what you're doing, execute your, what you're supposed to do really well, and then the satisfaction that you get from it makes you kind of realize or feel that you're a good tool, you're a good medium of Krishna in a way. I mean, kind of, kind problem. of, yeah. If you do your duty properly, mm. and um, it's said in the scripture in the Gita, that one who does their duty properly, then the God is satisfied by that, in a general sense. Just like if you live in the country, like in America, I live in America, so if you're a good citizen, then the president's happy with you. <laughs> that could be a problem. <laughs> but that doesn't mean he's going to write you a letter, right? Or come knocking on your door and say, you did a great job. It's a very, in a very general sense, you've satisfied God. So there are, then there are more progressive ways to get to know God. You could... Just like in a, in a political example, you could attach yourself to the president's campaign. And maybe he'd say, hi, thank you for joining the campaign. And then, ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> he talked to me, the president. <laughs> Something like that. Hmm? And then, of course, other things can develop too. Some people get to know him intimately and it becomes a problem. <laughs> 